It's time for your IPMA PDH Power Hour monthly training session with your host, Blair Barnhart. Let's get started. Hey guys, this is Blair, Founder and Executive Director of the International Pavement Management Association. So glad you could tune in here to the IPMA PDH Power Hour this month. We're so happy that you guys could be part of this amazing journey, this big circle of pavement managers. This, uh, this was news too good and I had to share it from an amazing location. So I brought the Better Roads bus here to the Grand Canyon of all places to share this PDH power with you for this session on soil stabilization. So what you're about to see is a short training video, 60 minutes as you might have imagined with the PDH power hour. A short training video and we'll talk about building a structure, a road from the bottom up. Now I just spent the better part of yesterday over at an uh, Indian reservation uh, in Tucson, Arizona, uh, the Tohono O'odham, Tohono O'odham Nation, and they were in a alluvial fan, if you will. The road was built right through a wash area, and as a result, and you can well imagine, the road was built fairly well, but because of the flooding that occurs on a regular basis, the road has been washed out in several areas. So the folks over there are looking at doing some detention ponds to control the water. And on top of that, we're going to rebuild the road, about three miles of roadway with cement treated base or soil stabilization at its best. We'll probably go down 12 or 14 inches and build basically an impervious structure so that even when the water does take over the top of the road surface, the um, underlying structure will still be rock solid, and hence the Grand Canyon. You know, I don't know if you guys picked up on the analogy there, the metaphor, but if we can build these roads, much like the Grand Canyon and how long it's existed in its state and its beauty here, if we can build roads with a solid structure underneath them, they're going to last a lot longer. So we'll go out, we'll watch a few slides here of a webinar presentation that I did, talk a little bit about cement treated base, soil stabilization, some soil modification, lime stabilization, and so forth. Now there's a lot of different chemical agents that are available uh, at our perusal uh, for the toolbox of soil stabilization and FDR for that matter. The important thing to remember here is that depending on your region, you may or may not be able to get your hands on certain materials. So keep that in mind as you specify these projects. So on the back end of the, the little PowerPoint training uh, series here. I'm going to throw in a 20 minute session where I spent the better part of a day watching the thermal raceway being built in the Coachella Valley, California. Now Marco Estrada has been involved with soil stabilization and FDR as long as I have and here's two industry uh, folks out there just chatting it up about soil stabilization and take out of there the nuggets that are going to help you with your local agencies, saving your roads, keeping them, uh, to making them last longer if you will, but more importantly when you're doing new construction and building new platforms, keep soil stabilization in the back of your mind because as you'll see in Marco's case, the savings to cement treat in place the base of the raceway was a significant amount versus trucking in all new rock. And think about the economical savings and the ecological savings along the way. So I hope you enjoy this PDH Power Hour, the IPMA PDH Power Hour. If you'd like a PDH certificate hanging on your wall, go ahead and click the link that's attached to this uh, page and we'll get one of those in the mail to you for a six dollar and ninety seven cent fee. You know Lee's got to put the gold stamp on and get it into a nice little certificate for you and get it in the mail off to your local agency or your private sector firm. If you haven't joined IPMA yet, a local agency free, no charge, no strings attached, you'll get one of these PDH power hours once a month and if you're private sector this is the biggest no-brainer ever, $197 a month or a mere $19.99 a year. 
and just know that we're out there driving America for better roads, trying to promote all things pavement management, in-place recycling, pavement preservation. So glad you could tune in here. I'll get a little B-roll so you can enjoy the view here, and we'll get started with the PDH Power Hour. But uh, I did have the pleasure to be in Thermal, California, which is down in the Coachella Valley, and I spent the day with one of the contractors there doing the soil stabilization on a indie type track, I can't say exactly, or a Le Mans style track. If you guys are familiar with that project, know that they weighed the options of bringing in aggregate versus stabilizing the in situ soil. And they uh, ruled out bringing in any new aggregate. And they did all of this project with soil stabilization with the Portland cement in this case. And I had the opportunity to get a bunch of video footage of that. But in any case, there's an example of what's like to be stuck in the mud and hence the uh, advent of road building as we know it today. But now, after seeing some of the, the job sites like this one, for example, this was a parking lot at a Lexus dealership in Metro Atlanta. And we had the call to come down and look at this. I think we had the paving contract, if I remember. And there was no way that we were ever going to get that project open in time for them to sell cars on whatever day they wanted to start selling the cars. So we went in and did quick lime stabilization or you might say mud drying. Uh, when we do this stabilization it's usually about 6% by weight of the material going into a given cubic yard of the dirt or whatever material we're being dealt with. Whereas if we do modification and I'm sure uh, a lot of you are uh, well versed in this even in terms of modification but if you put two or three percent of the quick lime or the Portland cement in depending on the soil type we've had a lot of success in these particular applications by going in especially in the uh, wet damp climates and doing the quick lime or the Portland cement modification and soil stabilization so this job if you can imagine you think about the soil type that we're dealing with here, high plasticity soil, saturated in water. You know, the, there's one of our workers out there with his uh, work boots on, the mud boots or the rain boots, whatever you want to call it. I went out there with a backhoe and I took the, you can see in the back there, uh, that's a pile of quicklime, it's like aggregate, just like a, a dump truck brings it in, and it's coarse aggregate, or it's basically one inch chunks of quicklime and I took the backhoe bucket and sprinkled it around there and sipped it around with the back end of the machine. Uh, when we could, we would go in with the pulverizer, but if you get up close to these appurtenances like we have here, sometimes it has to be done kind of by hand, if you will, with the back end of a rubber tire backhoe or something like that. Uh, so top left-hand corner, just a reminder that, and by the way, this was not my excavator. I have been in a similar situation before on ice and the ice broke underneath me at a golf course one day and I could have been in this situation had I not tracked away on the ice as fast as I could and I got out of there uh, before I sunk but the quick lime and the cement are not meant to fix everything but remember what I told you guys yesterday about the Natchez Trace Parkway. Bottom right hand corner this is a job that we did in Vidalia again with the quick lime and this was a muddy dirt road that didn't have a lot of traffic on it so we just did the quick lime stabilized base and the city of Vidalia just put a uh, let's see what you guys call it um, not a chip seal but it was just a prime and sand if you will so a prime coat of uh, diluted emulsion and sand as a choker on top so here's the case for stabilization uh, over the last 60 years, the whole industry has exponentially grown. It's effective, it's fast, it costs less than the alternate alternatives. The growth of green construction is uh, obviously at the top of everyone's mind. And building on unsuitable locations now, a lot of the cities and counties have used up all of their good land. So really all that's left is these swampy areas uh, where you've got to knock trees down and, and the likes of that. So it's always going to be more cost effective if you can go in and treat the existing soil rather than trying to muck it all out and haul new material in. So we'll go through some of the scenarios here and I don't expect everyone to walk away here knowing everything there is to know about stabilization 
and trust me when I tell you that I'm not a lab rat and I certainly um, am not a chemist and a lot of this soil stabilization involves some uh, high level chemistry and, and I'm not about to uh, purport that I know everything there is to know about this but what I can tell you is that I've been standing knee deep in mud on a Monday and on Tuesday the ground is so hard that we can't even scrape it with a motor grader trying to open up a Bass Pro Shop. Uh, if you, so one day the concrete trucks can't even get into the proper to pour the footings. The next morning uh, after remixing the quick line and trying to grade it out with a motor grader, you can't even grade it. It gets so hard. So just think about how you can change a soil from plastic soil uh, that's wet and saturated and literally overnight turning that into a friable sand that's compactable and can be uh, readily trafficked with a lot of the heavy equipment and such. So subgrade problems are the number one cause of major change orders in DOT grading and pavement construction today. This leads to anticipated, unbudgeted, like I mentioned before with the mill and inlay project, cost and significant changes in the scope of work. The majority of DOTs that widely use soil stabilization followed the same roadmap. So here we have the case where uh, five to ten dollars um, per meter unbudgeted undercuts, or five to ten million dollars unbudgeted undercuts, states looking at subgrades more closely. So if all of a sudden you get hit with a one million dollar change order when you're trying to build a bridge abutment, it, it's certainly a shock in the um, the budget. So the General contract rejects the payment warranties and poor quality subgrade is the the fault of that. Subgrade stabilization becomes a contractor op option during construction. So at the onset of uh, even the Home Depot build outs and the likes of that, if you flip open the bid documents for a lot of these big high level projects, you'll see that there's a contingency item now put in there for a lime stabilized base. So depending on the region or depending on the climate and the rainfall amounts when they're building out some of these huge buildings and bridges and, and tunnels and likes of that, you may be uh, well suited to go ahead and put a contingency bid item in there ahead of time for the addition of soil stabilization or subgrade modification. So an economic problem, of course, if, you, if you're trying to pour a footing or a foundation wall and you can't even get a truck back there anywhere near the project and it's raining for the next two weeks, uh, this can obviously cause a lot of delays and a lot of these places are relying on opening up for a particular time, uh, perhaps December 1st, so they can uh, capitalize on some of the uh, Christmas expenditures and the likes of that. And this has often been the case when we've had our backs up against the wall as a contractor project completed on time. So whenever we have wet or weak subgrade soils at the poor working platforms or perhaps the actual dirt doesn't meet the requirements needed for density, rather than digging everything out and hauling it all away, now's the time to consider coming in there and this is right back to the Lexus dealership that I was mentioning before you know we sent a rubber tire backhoe in there wallowing around in four-wheel drive he's about 12 or 14 inches deep with those front tires carrying the bucket of quick lime and believe it or not the next morning there was not a drop of water on site the the quick lime is mixed in with the sub sub base soil remixed the next day and I'm going to mention this in an upcoming slide here I'm going to throw out the caution flag here on quicklime because it's very important that there's a remixing operation. And I'll cite an example why if you stick with me. The common approaches are pay to excavate, pay to remove from the site. So now you're trucking mud away from the site and you're paying to dump it off the site. And then you're going to pay for boro material to come back in. And good luck finding anything that's dry if it's been raining for two weeks. Aggregate, fabric. And before you know it, you got a $300,000 change order. So pay for that material to be placed and compact it. It's a vicious circle. Rather, if you can go in with the cement or the fly ash or the quick lime or any combination of lime kiln dust or something similar, the, sub, the soil stabilization is essentially engineering existing pore soil into a high performance material. Now, the, the shot in the top is working around the confines of an industrial complex, whereas the shot at the bottom, I'll, I'll tell you what this is, 
uh, there was a big dam project being built here in Dahlonega, Georgia. We were mixing the uh, sub-base soil, or sorry, let me back up a step. We were making soil to build the earth dam wall with, but the soil had to be treated. Rather than trying to do it in place at the dam itself, we mixed the soil on the ground on the level, remixed it the next day, loaded it onto pans or scrapers or earth movers, whatever you want to call them, and then the earth movers moved the treated soil down to the location, it might have been maybe a mile away, and put the material that was treated into the earthen berm and compacted it in place. So many different types of applications of way of getting through here and doing this, but treating the unsuitable soils in place or off-site and moving it to where we need it. We can use the appropriate chemical for the soil types at hand at the appropriate application rate, so very fixed cost control on the project, and mix thoroughly to a depth of 16 inches or more. Now the bottom right-hand corner of that machine is a 650 uh, of CMI or Terex now, but that machine is capable of going down upwards of 20 or 21 inches in depth to treat those uh, problematic soils. Then we can compact it, shape it, and seal it. Again, a reminder, Portland Cement, the Quicklime, uh, big difference there in the remixing stages. So Portland Cement is going to go to work right away, uh, especially if we use a Type 3 Portland Cement. I don't know if I mentioned that yesterday, Robert, but when we did the runway extension, uh, the the contract specified type 3 Portland cement to get an expeditious set and after we saw how well that performed each and every job we ever did thereafter we always tried to get the cities or counties to do the type 3 Portland cement so expeditious set whereas the quick line when we do that for modification or stabilization we have to remix it the following day uh, very important that the material is mellowed as it's called if you've ever heard that term uh, terminology. So here we have an example of 10,000 square yards of poor subgrade. This could be any city or county in America. It could be new construction, it could be old road building, it could be down there at the Thermal Raceway for that matter in the Coachella Valley. But a typical cut fabric stone is going to be about $140,000 and a spread mix 16 inches and compact is going to be about $50,000. So 30 to 50 percent of the cost of conventional cut and fill. The price break, again, even with the stabilization uh, or the uh, soil stabilization, is about two to 3,000 square yards. So whether you're doing FDR or whether you're doing soil stabilization, about the type, uh, size of job that you would require to get a, you know, a good price, a good unit price would be, I would try to aim for about 10,000 square yards or more at any given time. And again, the hot in place and cold in place trains substantially more volume needed and there's probably the more likelihood of bringing a contractor in from out of state to do that work. You, you're more apt to have five or six local FDR contractors whether they have the small machines or the big machines. So two main benefits of soil stabilization for pavement construction here. Modification, again about two to three percent of the material is going to be used to do the modification and that's by weight so you've got a hundred pound dirt you figure two pounds of your modification product stabilization uh, again uh, upwards of five to six percent so a good rule of thumb if you're doing the Portland cement and by the way let me share this tip with you while we're talking about this so because every day I try to learn something new and one of my county engineers taught me this when he does his FDR or stabilization work with the little zipper or the Zinitis milling head whatever he uses there he just rents whatever he can get his hands on um, he does it in-house what he does is he calls the ready mix plant and asks the driver to just bring Portland cement to the job site. So think about that. A lot of the batch plants that we see for ready mix concrete, the mix actually gets done in the truck. The truck is acting as the mixer. So the water, the slag, the Portland cement, the rock, the sand, they all get dumped into the ready mix truck and then on the way to the job site they add the water and mix it up so it's ready mix concrete when it lands on the job site. Well, what he does, this is Daryl Wiggins from Heard County, Georgia, he orders, uh, he, he, and I'll show you in a second how to figure this out, but he orders up the 
three or four ton of Cortland cement dry. It comes out into the job site with the ready mix concrete mixer and they just slide the Portland cement dry down the chute and it just flows like baby powder or talcum powder. And you can take a, a roll of tar paper from Home Depot and cut it into, it's already 36 inches wide so you cut it at 36 inches to make a one square yard of tar paper. And you can lay that out on the ground and weigh the material and you can actually do a little weigh belt calibration right on the job site with a very crude, you know, twenty dollar scale uh, from the local uh, staples or whatever thirty dollar scale. So dump it into a uh, plastic pail from Home Depot. Know your uh, weight of the pail and then figure out the weight of the cement. But generally speaking, for stabilization, you're going to be aiming for six or seven pounds of cement per inch per square yard. So. If your goal is to get in there and stabilize 10 inches deep, and again, I said this yesterday, so if you get in there 10 inches deep, the Portland cement is going to be at 7 pounds, 70 pounds per square yard is going to give you a hard, uh, stabilized platform to work on. So basically, call up the ready mix concrete guys instead of fooling around with the bags at Home Depot. And yet, by the way, on the first day, I promised you I'd, I'd show you guys how to figure out your network level average uh, network level replacement value of your roadway so uh, just before we go to break I'll go ahead and share that with you too if you take your entire uh, center lane miles and we'll just figure two uh, lanes here we won't complicate things with three and four lane highways but uh, just figure out uh, we'll use uh, we'll pick on Jeremy for a sec so City of Willis let's just say you have a hundred center lane miles Jeremy take your hundred center lane miles Figure 13,000 square yards for every mile that you have and multiply that in your case by about, I'm going to say 70 bucks a square yard because I I don't know how close your asphalt plants are and what you're paying for mix and concrete and all that stuff, but let's just say take that big number that you get, all those square yards, multiply it by 70 bucks a square yard. That's the total network level replacement value. And if you want to do that over the break and get back to us and let us know what you come up with, uh, so 100 center line miles times 13,000 square yards per center line mile, this is a 22 foot wide road, say, you get that huge multi million dollar number, multiply that by 3%, and that would be the optimum amount of money you need per year to take care of your roads and maintain a PCI level or raise it depending on where you're at. So whatever that dollar value is, I would just challenge you to try to come up with that each year to take care of your roadways and all the other city county engineers that are listening in here. It's a good way to figure out in a very quick manner of a few soft engineering costs and the curb and gutter and the, uh, remember total replacement value. We're not talking about FDR on a two inch overlay here. So when you put this into your Street Saver software and you set up the decision tree and it spits out that GASB 34, 34 module calculation, remember it's hitting on the FDR that's in your decision tree. It's not hitting on this network level replacement value. And this is the number that I'd like you to use for your overall network level value, replacement value. Okay. So if any one of you wants to do that with your center line miles of road, a little quiz there for you. There, we won't be grading these, but a very quick way to determine the average network level value, replacement value, I should say, of your roadway system. So here we are out wallowing around in the mud and you can see that those tires, you know, I could stand beside one of those tires that comes up to my shoulders. So that's about three feet deep into the mud there with the 6500, or sorry, the 2500 orc and pulverizer there. And here is a typical spreader. This was, if you recall, yesterday I showed you photographs of the Big Canoe Homeowners Association. This is up in the mountains of North Georgia. And we're putting Portland cement down, spreading it at about 40 or 50 pounds per square yard. And notice that the roadway has already been pre pulverized or obliterated. Okay. And again, the shot, uh, if you recall, 
yesterday I said that this was a theater that was getting ready to open and let's talk about unsuitable soils here for just a second uh, and I know this because my son is friends with the son of one of the folks that was involved with the construction of the theater uh, what happened we no sooner got the road ready for certificate of occupancy and it got paved but guess what everyone the theater wall sunk because the footings were poured on unsuitable soil <laughs> I'm sorry I shouldn't be making fun of this so um, my son's friend's father he had a barn out in the country they had to take all the seats out of the theater and jack up the footings or do something to re-pour everything or uh, do something for and incidentally there's some more useless information for everybody there's actually a, a, some some building in Quebec back up in Canada that's sinking so what they do is they permanently freeze the uh, ground that's underneath the footing 20, uh, 12 months of the year they keep the ground frozen so the footing doesn't sink. So we're going to go through uh, these series of slides rather quickly. I don't expect, again, everybody to be experts when they leave here on the entire uh, stabilization aspect or even like Robert just mentioned here with if you get to a site where you have to apply some uh, product here to clean up a, a, a hazardous waste or contaminated site. Uh, you can also use a lot of these materials and similar techniques to do so. So whether it's modification, stabilization, or decontamination, everything that you touch with any of these different treatments is going to be a lot more cost-effective. So stable working platform during construction. Here we have the folks out uh, using the DCP, the dynamic cone penetrometer, and finding out, hey, you know, this this dirt got really hard all of a sudden prevents rutting pushing and shoving during paving so uh, Violetta that was seven pounds per inch per square yard so the question was what was the amount of cement used per square yard to stabilize so if a, a good rule of thumb is six or seven pounds per square yard per inch so again 10 inches of stabilized base figure 60 or 70 pounds of cement. Now, again, I'm going to back up and use the 30 tons of Natchez, or sorry, 30 miles of Natchez Trace Parkway as an example. The mix designed to achieve the 300 PSI that we were trying to aim for in the field, we only ever ended up using 38 pounds per square yard, but know that that was a lot of asphalt, aggregate, and under dirt mixed together. Uh, so if you're doing a sizable job, it would do well, Violetta, to go out and get a job mix formula for the Portland cement. And they're going to just run breaks in the laboratory and come up with the optimum cement. Resist the urge to put too much cement in because then you're going to just open yourself up to have a lot more cracking that you really don't need. And while I'm on the subject, uh, don't hesitate to learn a little bit more about the micro cracking, not to be confused with micro paving or micro surfacing. Micro cracking involves going out, as, as crazy as this sounds, you go out the next day after you've done the cement stabilized base and you put a vibratory roller on and you pound the heck out of it, for lack of a better word. You go out there and try to expedite the cracking, the shrinkage cracking that's ultimately going to happen anyways. And the thought process with the Portland Cement Association is now we're going to go out and force this Portland cement to crack instead of waiting for it to crack down the road. What it does is it creates a finer pattern or spider web of smaller cracks that don't cause as much problem in the asphalt that's put down on top. So I uh, believe that city of Santa Ana took uh, good advantage of this uh, this technique called micro cracking. So in this uh, particular example, we've got subgrade stabilization equals improved pavement performance. And and by the way, in the this photograph that I showed you of the sinking theater and the sinking roadway, we eliminated the aggregate base course. So we did the symmetry to base, and as a result the paving contractor eliminated the aggregate layer so they went ahead and paved the binder asphalt right on top of the cement treated base. I just want to point out that when we do these FDR projects or stabilized bases you can eliminate a good portion of the ultimate paving section because you've grown the structure from the bottom up. So in typical pavements a soft zone develops at the bottom of the base course the stabilized subgrade moves that zone down to below the stabilized layer 
where its effect on the pavement are reduced or eliminated. So some of the stabilization chemicals here, there are many different chemicals to use. Uh, modification, stabilization, again modification 3%, drying 3%, 2 or 3% and stabilization. The chemical use should be based on the soil type and project conditions, local specifications and stabilization contractor recommendations. Now let me warn you, I'll use Hartsfield Airport as an example. The contractor bid the job to do upwards of 10 or 12 loads of Portland cement every day. And at the time, the industry was booming, the housing commercial industry was booming in Metro Atlanta. There were allocations such that the contractor that bid 12 loads of cement was only allowed to get three a day. Um, so as you put these contracts out for bid, you know, you may be fixated on doing something with quickline, but at the end of the day, you may find out that the local steel plan or something has increased production twofold and they need to have more lime brought to the steel factory. And now the contractor is saying, hey, uh, you know what here, William, I, I can't get my hands on lime. I want to switch this job to cement and get the same end result. So as long as the mixed design dictates that you will indeed get similar results, don't be hesitant to change out midstream on a project that the industry cannot get their hands on the material to do the work at hand as it was specified, if that makes sense. So everything is relying on these commodities to be shipped to the job site. The three most common chemicals for soil stabilization are quick lime, Portland cement, and lime kiln dust, and fly ash is also used in some areas depending on industry in that particular area. And here's some of the chemistry that makes up, and again, understand that the quick lime comes in two different sizes. Uh, you can get it in rock size or what we call pellet size. Uh, we've done either or with good success, but in any case, uh, even though we tried to force the issue on the mellowing and try to get it to mellow on the same day, I highly recommend a 24-hour mellowing period if you're going to use quick lime. Um, one of the advantages to the quick lime is you can also get a fine size quick lime that is dust free or dust proof. They've coated it with something so that when it comes out of the truck it doesn't dust up so to speak or uh, look like there's a big cloud of dust anywhere. Uh, the lime kiln dust is going to take about twice as much or sometimes three times as much so as you're working through if you're a consultant or a contractor you gotta start thinking about the logistics of getting that material to the job site. Now instead of putting down seven or eight inches of cement you're having to put down you know, 20 inches deep of lime kiln dust and wallowing around in the job site with that. Portland cement, wherever possible, if you can get your hands on type 3 Portland cement, highly recommend that. Uh, very expeditious set and you don't have to spend uh, the rest of your nights worrying whether or not you're going to get a good set before you do your paving project. Uh, here are the different soil types in correlation with the types of stabilizing agents. You can see that we have Portland cement, lime kiln dust and quick lime and again I remember seeing a slide from Portland Cement Association now it might have been a little biased right but they said uh, the US Army Corps said that if your back is against the wall and you don't have time to get a proper mix design you can feel pretty darn sure that the Portland Cement is going to be the universal stabilizing agent so keep that in mind if your back is up against the wall and you you have a very short window of opportunity to get out there and get something done uh, what, whatever the case may be, if it's a dam that's busted and you've got to get the dirt back in and get it set up, whether you're doing it with a little zipper or a milling head yourself in-house or whether you've got a 800 or a 1,000 horsepower pulverizer out there doing it, uh, something to consider. So here's a microscopic view of what's going on there with the flocculation and agglomeration and the lime. Again, taking a plastic soil and modifying it into a friable sand uh, so it totally changes the physical properties of sand and does have some chemical enhancement as well. Long term set with the lime, quick term set with the Portland cement. Okay, um, let's see. And again, I mentioned this yesterday. Portland cement resists the urge to over cement something because you're going to end up having a lot of shrinkage cracking that you don't need. You're going to raise the PCI uh, much higher than it needs to be. Or, uh, 
the PSI, sorry, much higher than it needs to be. I would much rather see if you're looking for 450 in the lab, 300 PSI in the field, and for whatever reason you have a choice of putting more cement or going deeper, I'm more about doing 250 PSI at 12 or 14 inches deep and hitting it with a 30 ton roller and a big sheep's foot pad foot roller like the three uh, the three drum roller, the trash compactor type roller that they used at the thermal raceway. I'm more about going deep with less cement than going rigid in a thinner section with more cement because so many times I've had the call from a city or a county that says, hey Blair, uh, you know, the paving job, we, we tried to skimp, we tried to save money, we only put an inch of asphalt down on the cement treated base and the city council is wondering why it's cracking. It's only like a year and a half old. Well, I, I try to, you know, I try to always get people to do less cement, deeper section and thicker asphalt pavement on top and I wouldn't be opposed to going out and trying to do the open graded or gap graded mixes, the, the interlayers on top of the Portland cement stabilized base before the hot mix asphalt comes on and the micro cracking is definitely something you want to look at. Marco's a professional engineer here in the state of California and uh, while I've been over on the east side of the Mississippi pulverizing and stabilizing what seems like all my life, you've been doing the same over here. Absolutely. I almost came and worked with Marco at one point in my life and uh, our paths have crossed many times and today I've had the good fortune to catch up with Marco on the first day on a project doing cement tree to base Absolutely. in lieu of conventional construction. Now, this is a, remember, I didn't say reconstruction, I said construction, so Absolutely. I'm gonna let Marco dig in with you guys and tell you all the explicit details. And when we wrap up, we'll go over the top three reasons why this is a viable option. So, Marco, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Absolutely, uh, my name is Marco and I'm with Pavement Recycling Systems here out of Southern California. My background is in soil stabilization and dealing with lime and cement stabilized materials primarily for uh, pavement and building foundations alike. Uh, the applications of uh, cement stabilization here locally is a growing process, uh, but one that has been around for a long time. It's been around here in California for well over 50 years. Uh, for this particular project here, we were looking at the consideration of, from a design standpoint, of several alternatives. One was removing the material and subsequently exporting it off-site and importing class 2 aggregate base uh, in order to address subgrade instability issues uh, and design long-term performance of the material in terms of a, from a structural pavement yeah. design. Yeah. So it, the other option was to solely import a thin section of aggregate base that they were looking to design the, the uh, pavement section with anyway and cement stabilize that material to address subgrade instability to address a relatively low permeable material as well because water is a big issue out in this area and then also the long-term performance of the uh, the pavement structure those were the three primary reasons that we were looking to address. I think, I think it's worth and I've said this before to you learners back in the Academy that not only does Marco now have the option of doing a 10 inch or 8 inch layer for the pavement section but if we come across an area that's specifically really soft, we can go down and treat it, I think, about 21 inches deep with that 2,500 work. Absolutely. That's one of the benefits that I emphasize to many engineers with regards to this process is that you have the remediation uh, equipment and material on site. You can essentially correct these, these areas of instability on the fly, so to speak. I, I always try to get like a 3% overrun on cement just to allow for the odd soft spot along the way. And the great news is you can be out here in the middle of the dark at midnight. You don't have to call for a change order. Absolutely. It's already in the contract. Uh, you put the machine in a little bit deeper, you got the big compaction equipment, you're going to find a soft spot. And then next morning it's going to be, I hate to use the word hard as Hades, but Absolutely. it's going to be set up and ready to pave. So. Right. Um, anyways, carry on. You're no, doing a great job. No, no, absolutely. And this is one of the added benefits of having the uh, use the equipment. We're uh, we're working, guys. Uh, the added benefit of having that uh, the remediation built in into the system as a part of the design. You also factor in the remediation, the repair of these unsuitable areas again with the same technology, which is a huge benefit from an engineering standpoint. And as importantly, is the impact that the process has on construction schedules. Oh, I mean, let alone course. the yeah. cost up yeah. front 
and long-term savings, but the minimizing the construction schedule. On this particular project, uh, for today's production, uh, we're going to do approximately 80,000 square feet of soil cement uh, for a depth of six to eight inches. Uh, in order to accomplish this same uh, production with removal and replacement, it would actually take closer to two to three days to, to, to achieve the same area of production. Well, so and I, and I just want to chime in because yeah. I think I forget to say this a lot, Margo, but yeah. think about this. If you're back at your city or back at your county and you're doing a conventional undercut, right? so not only the time, but you just put 45 tractor trailers on all your other county and city roads, getting the rock to the job and getting Absolutely. the fill off the job, and they're tearing up all the other roads. So it's a real no-brainer, Marco. I mean, even if it was the same amount of money or even a little bit more, Absolutely. all things being considered equal now. On this particular project, uh, for one truckload of cement that we're bringing in to stabilize the subgrade, we're eliminating 40 to 50 truckloads of material. Ooh, wait, I think you I think you should repeat that. Yeah, Did so, you guys hear that? So for every truckload of cement that we that we bring in to stabilize the subgrade, we eliminate 40 to 50 truckloads of material off of the city or county streets. On, in the Subgrade. trash, plus and, the dumping, right? Absolutely. So and plus reducing the carbon footprint as well, which is what oh, things yeah. are all about as well. Yeah. It's not solely about economics. These days it's about, you know, the carbon footprint, the environmental uh, uh, the environmental aspects okay. uh, of carbon footprint. Well, now, I don't want to put you on the spot, <laughs> but a lot of... Uh, it's never know, stopped you before. <laughs> a lot of our learners are pretty sharp. Um, I know, John, from Caltran, you're sitting back there and you're probably thinking, well, they did say they're at the bottom of a lake bed. We're pretty close to the water table, and uh, the U.S. Army Corps has said at times that cement is 97% of the time is going to work on most every soil. But are there any chemical compatibility concerns when we start having a lot of salination in the dirt and being that close to water table, are there any adverse reactions that could take place um, and were they detected or would they be detected in a mix design? Mark? Very good question. Is that uh, when we encounter these areas where we do have uh, salt water or salt in the water, there are a couple of things that we do. We do use the, the water that is going to be sourced for the um, for the project okay. in the mix design. So if okay. we're working in an area where we're, say for example, yep. we were using a natural spring, yep. we would sample that water and use that in the mix design. Okay. On this particular project, uh, we're using um, uh, water from uh, hydrants, so okay. that's, not a, that's not an issue. Uh, but one of the things that we do have to concern ourselves from a, from a chemical standpoint is the, the concentration of water soluble sulfates. Okay. So uh, they have the potential to, to be uh, a detriment to the stabilization process, whether it's cement, as in this case, or we were dealing with lime, with any calcium-based stabilizer. Uh, the sulfates in the soil could be a detriment to the stabilization and, process. And that would be detected in the mix design process? That would be uh, detected in the mix design okay. and, and during the, uh, the laboratory investigation, during the geotechnical investigation. Okay. And, and um, but that, now on that same note, and yes. I don't know if you learners know this, and I'll try to find a photograph, but it's a lot of times people ask us, well, what about depth requirements and how do you check that? Um, there is a test with a certain chemical that makes the cement turn blue. That's correct. And That's it correct. starts with a P? Yeah, phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein. <laughs> Don't ask me to spell it. <laughs> Rocco, you're going to have to Google that one for us. Yeah. Um, and maybe you can find yeah. a picture on the internet uh, The, the idea behind that is that when we add cement or lime to a soil, we elevate the pH of the material. Okay. Okay. And phenolphthalein, again, don't ask me to spell it, <laughs> is a uh, essentially a pH indicator. I see. Uh, at a threshold pH of about 10 and a half, okay. it, it changes colors almost to a deep pink, okay. almost purple color. And so we use it as a way of checking the depth and the uniformity of mixing that we put it in a conventional spray bottle and we spray it onto the material that has been treated and it gives you the ability to identify it or to create a distinction between the treated and the untreated material. If the material turns pink, uh, that pink, deep pink color, it, uh, it has cement in it. Uh, if it doesn't, it's you know the native and, material. And it's a pretty clear break line too, it if is. I recall. It's a very clear break line. Yeah, because when the mixer comes with the work and pulverizer, it's a pretty consistent mat. Absolutely. Uh, so, and we're out here doing everything, and I might, might add that we've got the Trimble units on both sides. Again, 
Marco and I don't get paid to say this. We're, we, if we use the name, it's only because Absolutely. we want you guys to know what's going on out here with the equipment. Now, I did see the testing person walk by there, so while we're on that subject, sure. and I do bounce around a lot, and the learners are used to this, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I thought I heard him say you got 96% compaction. Absolutely. Uh, one of the, uh, the benefits of using soil cement or cement treated materials on this project uh, is, as Blair mentioned earlier, these are processes where we go through a mixed design. So they have engineering up front. Uh, as such, they also have engineering, testing, and inspection on the, during construction, which is one of the things that we emphasize. So we have an on-site geotechnical soils technician testing for relative compaction. Okay. In this case here, he did indicate that we're achieving an average uh, in-place density of 96% relative compaction and running at about a, a moisture content of about one to one and a half okay. over optimum consistently. Uh, but it's, it's a, very, a very good point that we emphasize as engineers and contractors that when you have the engineering on the front side, you gotta have the quality control testing. It makes sense. Absolutely. Otherwise, why would you have A without B, right? Absolutely. It's, it's kind of a little marriage there. So that's great advice for you guys uh, back in your office with your county or your city or your state. So I'd like to emphasize if you're going through your PCA documentation, there's a couple of options here in terms of prime code. Now, if you look at the back of the guide on the Soil Cement Handbook and some of the PCA, Portland Cement Association literature, I want to point this out, and I mentioned this to Marco earlier, you've got about three or four choices. You can prime this material. Absolutely. Uh, you can wet cure it for two or three or five days, however long it takes for that yes. material to break. If you're using type three cement, like we used to use in the Southeast, it could cure in one day. So Absolutely. you're responsible for one or two days of wet cure. Uh, number three, uh, you could go out and do a chip seal or service treatment or any bituminous layer on top. Under the eyes of the Portland Cement Association, the uh, prime can be a bituminous treatment. And I did an airport one time where we used 4.75 millimeter super pave sand mix in lieu of the prime. Now on this one, you're gonna wet cure. Marco. We are gonna wet cure. That's been the uh, general contractor's uh, choice is to wet cure. But one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, the soil cement doesn't know whether it has water, doesn't have an emulsion, uh, or whether it has the overlying pores. It could be an aggregate base. It continues to cure. Uh, one of the things that we do here locally is that once this material supports the weight of the subsequent operation. Uh, in this case, it could be an asphalt uh, uh, bituminous layer. It's ready to go. Okay. Okay. It's ready to go. The material is going to continue to cure. On this project here, uh, we've elected to moist cure for two to three days okay. prior to place placement of the asphalt. And uh, what is the asphalt section, by the way? This is a racetrack. I don't know if we told you guys that. But this is like a Le Mans style track? It is, it is. It's going to be going like 180 miles out yes. here. There's going to be uh, Lamborghinis and Ferraris oh I imagine going through this thing. Sir. Wow. So I believe they're placing a, a four inch uh, hot mix asphalt section on top. Two, two layers? Yes. Okay, so like a binder Yes. and then a top course. It's probably some high friction course like racetrack mix, right? It is. It is a racetrack mix. They did indicate that the uh, the asphalt pavement designers were out from your, your part of the country out okay. east and uh, they were specialists in uh, racetrack asphalt design. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, you know it and I know it that agencies and even private sector owners like we have here okay. can save a boatload of money. I mean, literally millions of millions of dollars have been saved over the last couple of decades. I think that was 1.2 boatloads. On this one uh, job alone? Yes, 1.2 uh, boatloads. Yeah. I mean, you think about the scope <laughs> of one project saving $1.2 million just by implementing soil cement or cement treated base. However you look at it, it's going to save you and your agency not only, and, and I think let's let's review these three things again, Margo, we had the truck traffic, right? You're eliminating all the truck traffic and that carbon footprint is going to be reduced. Absolutely. The delay the delay, the time that it takes to do the remove and replace is as much as three times as long to do the in-place stabilization. So you think about the owner out here wants to start generating income from this track like tomorrow. Absolutely. The sooner he gets it up and running, the sooner he gets his investment. Recruit. Absolutely. So speed of construction, environmentally sound. Structurally viable. Structurally and proven. I mean, and proven. And proven Absolutely. You don't have to take this to an engineer or a rocket scientist or a geologist for that matter. 
this is a proven technology that works. Absolutely. And I would say, given the choice, if I've had my back against the wall, I think of a job we did for every university one time, they wanted to done that weekend. There was no time to get a mix design. Absolutely. But I knew if we mobilized equipment there and started work Saturday morning, we could cement treat the base, and I knew it was going to work. Absolutely. So it's there very is, dependable. It's very dependable. There is. Uh, an engineering comfort with it as well. I mean, we generally design in this area here for unconfined compression strengths at seven days of three to four hundred psi, That's which a is good, a very good, good compatible point. strength for us here locally for yeah. pavement section design. And, let, and let's go, let's take that one step further. And I just okay. want to drill this home. And if I had my whiteboard out here, we'd do this. But I think you guys will get the gist of this. So many decades ago, say I'll use a state, not mentioning any names, rhymes with Mississippi, and. Um, <laughs> You know, here's how it went down. The agency got thinking, well, let's cement treat our Mississippi mud. So they said, okay, we're going to do this. Well, then it went to the consultants, and the consultants said, well, if they want 300 PSI, well, let's give them 400. Sure. And then the contractor said, well, if I'm going to put a bid bond on this job, I'm going to damn put 600 pounds in it Absolutely. and make sure it works. Absolutely. And as it turns out, then we had a lot of brittle cement treated base, yes. twice as much cement as we needed. Um, and unlike maybe the lime, where additional, adi more additional lime can help, help to a certain point. Cement really doesn't need much more than 300 Absolutely. or even 275 Absolutely. if we're in a thick section. So I think my advice, and I think, Marco, you can uh, expound on this a bit, is you're better off to be a little bit on the low side of the cement with a thicker section. Now, I'm, that's being said by a guy that did 900 PSI for the airports. Right. But, but in any case, know that a small amount of cement can give you a very good bridging factor. Absolutely. And that is, it's a very good point. Our, uh, our approach these days from an engineering standpoint is to keep the, the cement on the lower end of the threshold and, and approaching the thicker sections. And the installation of thicker sections, it does provide for the same economics, uh, economic savings, but it also provides for more, the word we use here, more compatible strength okay. for pavement section design. Okay. Uh, richer, Higher strengths aren't necessarily always better. Right. Now, and there's two more things I want to touch on before we wrap up. So, number one, and remind me, we'll come back. All right. Uh, you did a lot of microcracking for uh, City of Santa Ana. Yes. Microcracking. Yes. And then uh, I also want to touch on this because Marco has a world of experience, not just with cement, but with the quick limes and a lot of other stabilizing agents. And depending on the type of soil, you have to select what works best in your region. We're not here to promote cement. We're here to promote stabilized bases. That's correct. So whether you're using fly ash, whether you're using uh, mechanical even, you could put some uh, supplementary if you uh, had aggregates some. Aggregates? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so you've got your quick limes, uh, you've got your Portland cements, type one, type two, or three. But uh, I just want to pick Marco's brain a little bit and, and maybe get him to talk a little bit about some of the mud drying with the lime. Is, is that, is that a, I did a lot of it in the southeast, in the Georgia Absolutely. Ray Clay. And we still do that in this area as well. Um, there is an added benefit to using, uh, particularly in this area, the source of lime that we have is a high calcium quick lime, uh, which reacts uh, with the addition of water, creates an exothermic reaction, which generates a lot of heat. Uh, that heat, along with the water required to hydrate the lime, consumes moisture in the grade. And so that's an added benefit to the stabilization we encounter, particularly as we get closer to the ocean here. Uh, we encounter, in deep excavations, very wet clay materials. And lime is a commonly used reagent to, to consume that water, to expedite the drying of the material and give us a short-term strength, the short-term stability to support the con subsequent construction operations. And I, I just say that if you're trying to distinguish between the stabilization and the modification, as a general rule, we're five to six percent stabilizing, two to three percent modification. Absolutely, that's a good general rule. And, and don't be surprised if you're on the west coast and Marco comes out to dry up some mud and he sends a water truck along with the crew. It's the Absolutely. craziest thing. It's like you're in a mud bog, you can't even pull the ready mixer, the ready mix truck out, and then you're pouring more water in there with a the water truck Absolutely. to make the quick lime react. People look at us like we're crazy, Larry. You know that look. <laughs> and then that big cloud of steam and then it's yeah. all dry then. But literally the next day, you'll have all of the trucks moving. And again, it goes to speed of construction. It does. You know, if a Bass Pro Shop or a Cabello's has to open on you know December 1st for the Christmas season, there's no time for delays. 
Absolutely. So a lot of these Home Depots and that, they'll build mud drying right into the contract. Absolutely. And this is to me uh, one of the added benefits that gets overlooked many times in the soil stabilization process from an engineering standpoint is you have the solution built in with a little bit of foresight if you've incorporated the lime or the cement or stabilization of some sort into the design if you encounter these areas that are yielding and wet pumping very muddy soils you've built in the remediation of these of these uh, poor subgrade soil conditions by having the lime and the cement and the necessary equipment already on site. Yeah, yeah. There's, There's no very need to shut down. Cost. Absolutely. And for, especially for you agencies back there that are cash strapped, if you set up a job and it's one, if, if Marco comes in and bids it at 1.2 million, it's not going to run over. In fact, it's probably going to run under a little bit because there will be a contingency item in there They're for additional cement. And absolutely. we usually we're usually a little bit more liberal when we get to the job site. We're only going to put it in where absolutely necessary. So uh, let's talk a little bit about microcracking right quick. You got it. And then we'll wrap. Okay. Microcracking uh, as well, it's been around for a number of years, I believe, and you might know better than I, than I do about this, but I believe it or originated in Texas and they've been doing it longer than we have here in California. Well, that's Texas. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Texas is Texas, exactly. right? And so everything's big in Texas. Everything's big. <laughs> so, Okay, we're going to be two minutes. All right. Uh, what we do here is we've been doing microcracking for about uh, 10 years now, and the idea is to pre stress, uh, uh, provide a, a stress relief for the subgrade for the cement stabilized material, which is gaining strength, to give it a stress relief by rolling the material 24 to 48 hours with a steel drum vibratory roller in order to generate exactly microcracks in the grade that provide for a stress relief of the material to keep large cracks from propagating. Yeah, That's so the we're conceptual. forcing the cracks to come sooner. Absolutely. Basically. And Absolutely. smaller. Absolutely. Sooner and smaller. And uh, yeah, hey, I'll tell you what, this has been an amazing session. All right. Good uh, seeing you, Brad. Uh, go ahead and give the learners your email address because I know they're going to want to get a hold of you. Okay. My email address is Marco, M A R C O, Estrada, E S T R A D A, at Pavement Recycling. Uh, my cell phone number is 951-205-6000. If I could ever be of service, please give me a call. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next month.